There was a very famous publisher named Bob Beckham. He ran a company called Combine. And when I was out pitching my songs, I would often see Bob pitching his songs. He was pitching the songs of Chris Christopherson, Billy Swan, these great people that he had. And we'd sometimes be sitting right next to each other in the office waiting for our turn to play songs. So this one day, I was waiting to play songs, and Bob comes in, and he sits down. He says, hey, Lang, do you have any... Oh, everybody in town knew that Bob had a direct line to Felton Jarvis, who was the producer of Elvis. They knew that every couple of weeks, Felton would come by Bob's office and pick up any songs that he'd left for him and take them to Elvis, you know? So I said, yeah, I do have songs for Elvis. And he said, bring it to me at 3 o'clock or whatever. Well, you had to have a disc cut. Yet, yet it, you couldn't take a tape because Elvis would put him on usually apparently a cheap record player in the studio and he'd play it. And if he didn't like it, he'd just sort of frisbee it across the, <laughs> you know, the studio. You know, I said, man, I don't want to get frisbeed. But I had to go to Ray. I said, these cost 20 bucks to get these things done. Can I do it? And he's, yeah. Get one song on each side. You know, and I was, okay. So I, I, I had three songs that I was thinking of. One was Rub It In. Um, one was Way Down, and another one called Don't Boogie Woogie When You Say Your Prayers Tonight, which became a big hit by some other guy in another country. But these were three songs. Going out the door, and the secretary, who knew all my songs because I wrote them like four feet from her desk, and she was thoroughly sick of me and glad when I was going out to pitch a song somewhere. She said, I said, I'm thinking of Way Down, you know, rubbing it. But she said, I would play him Way Down. It was the one song I probably wasn't going to put on this disc because I could only put two. So I take it over there and he ends up recording it. And I owe it totally to Bob Beckham who decided to give me a chance when he could have used that slot for his writers. And when I went to thank him, I mean, it was amazing, Otis. He, he, I bought him a bottle of wine, if you can think of anything more absurd. You know, I said, look, this is like... Nothing compared to what you did for me. And he said, well, I think I know what you're talking about. And I said, you, I, you changed my entire life, you know. I, you know. But that crazy, double crazy part of it was in whenever, I think it was 56, January of 1956, my mom is driving my seventh grade girlfriend and me to a movie. It's, so it's dark. We're in the back seat, sort of making out, you know. And Heartbreak Hotel comes on the radio. And, and I leaned forward and said, Mom, who is that? Please turn it up. And she said, I don't know. So at the end, the guy says, that was a young man from Tupelo, Mississippi, named Elvis Presley. I said, God almighty. I mean, that was just changed. I, I, it really did change my entire life. I was obsessed with music, like from then on, never thinking that I would write a song or anything. Um, so the day that Felton Jarvis was mixing way down in the studio, mixing, you know what that, that is, of course, but in case people don't know, that's when you balance the instruments and make sure they're right. And, uh, <clears throat> he says, Lang, I'm mixing way down. You want to come over and, and hear it? I said, well, I'd never met Felton, and I'd never met Brent Mayer, who was the engineer, and he became a famous record producer, did the judge and everything, but I'd never met either one of them. And so I walk into this ante room of the studio, and, and I hear this thundering, you know, bass and drums. I said, God, that is my song, you know. So I open the door and I'm telling you, the it's so loud, Otis, that it's like ripples your clothes. It's just beyond belief. Oh, God damn, you know. So um, he turns the music down and I said, hi, Felton, I'm Lang. And he says, well, good to meet you. And he said, this is Brent. And he said, you know him, I'm sure. I said, no, I've never met him either, you know. Turn the lights down, turn the music back up. He says, sit on this couch. So I, I lean back on that couch and I think, so it's 20 years after the day that I'm leaning in my backseat of my car and he's singing my goddamn song. That's impossible. How the hell, how does this fucking happen to anybody, you know? So anyway, that's that was one of the more amazing moments. I think it's fair to say, Virtually no one who gets into songwriting for sure is doing it for the money because it's so uncertain. If you make any money, you you better have another hit pretty soon right behind it because the money, you know, 
if you've got a family or anything, you, you need the money. Um, so the money was not, I mean, I could, it was just this huge bow on my life. And I said, this has happened. This amazing present that these people gave to me is unbuyable. I could be a quillionaire, Howard Hughes' son, you know, Bezos' son, Gates' son. You can't buy an Elvis record or a, a you know, Whitney Houston record or any, whoever. You, you have to somehow, it's got to happen to you or, you know, or whatever. So that was just a bit, I just couldn't get over it. I couldn't sleep. My people didn't believe me. You know, I didn't really tell anybody, but even my mom said, Lang, are you sure? You know, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that's, I, I'm sure you, you know, this feeling that like, you can't tell anybody, like I, I did not tell people that I got Elvis because I'd never knew if it would come out. I'd never knew what would happen. And even until you're actually holding the record. And I've actually known people who have, are holding the record, Otis, and the company changes its mind and you don't know it and the record is not actually going to be yours. So there are all these things that you just learned that from painfully that you you just shut up and if something good happens, fine, and let other people say, I heard it on the radio or it's great or whatever, but you don't. <laughs> be the spreader you let the record or the whatever do the do the work for you